In this workshop on the rhetorical reading notes, I want to take some time to walk through how we can use the rhetorical reading notes worksheet or anything you derive from it uh, to consider how to approach text that may, may often be unwieldy or difficult to access or sometimes boring uh, for, our, uh, for our purposes. And when we talk about this class and we talk about rhetorical reading notes, we're talking about a specific handout that your instructor has given you to help you to access the text. We should immediately discuss the affect aspect of this, right? No one or few people like taking notes, it just seems so redundant because it's something we already do mentally. And if that's the case, why bother taking the notes of it? Well, consider this. What you're reading for this class and other classes in the future generally is not going to be a simple text. It's not going to be a Harry Potter, for example. You don't read it from start to finish in one sitting or forward in one sitting. Academic texts are different kinds of texts that require much access or differences, different approaches. So in this, in this workshop, I want to take some time to walk through answering the question, why do we read rhetorically? Why ask these kinds of questions? Walk through specific questions from the rhetorical reading notes worksheet and then kind of revisit some of those ideas in the end. When we talk about rhetorical reading, we're asking questions about the rhetorical aspects of the text, considering the author, the purpose, uh, the textual elements, how it's structured, its arrangement. And when we do this, what we're doing is taking a text apart and looking at its features to help us to get a grip on a text. So whether you're reading uh, an ENC 1101 from the Lo New London Group about digital or academic literacies, or you're reading for ENC 1143, and you're reading from Binkley and Smith's uh, on postmodern geography. These are not easy to access ideas. In fact, these are 20 or 30 pages of complex ideas built on complex scholarship that you can't simply sit, read, and say, I get it. That'll be insufficient because there's a next step, right? There's using and applying these ideas, being able to explain them in other moments so you can build on their scholarship. So when we do this thing, we read rhetorically, we do it for a couple reasons. One, though, is to enter the conversation, the academic conversation. These authors have read something, they're putting forth new information, and you're now reading that new information to do something new with it as well. When we ask rhetorical questions also, we, we have the opportunity to look at um, how the author sees the world. It's very easy for us to read a chapter uh, like the New London text or like uh, the Binkley and Smith text and see that it's informative. They're, these are people who are just sharing information. But we need, to be, we need to be kind of tentative in that approach because oftentimes these texts aren't simply informative. There's argumentation taking place here. And it's not just this is the truth in words. You have to be a canny reader and think about, well, do I agree with this? Do I see what they're doing? Is it logical? Is it illogical? Does it fit my reality, my worldview? In order to kind of build up your knowledge base, thinking about how you could use elements of a text, for example, to complicate how you see the world. So when we walk through the rhetorical reading notes, we see there are several different sections here, and it starts with the kind of the most global component, context. Context is important because it tells us where something fit in time. So when you talk about, for example, the Binkley and Smith article from 2006, that wasn't written in 2016 or 1996 or 1906, and that matters because things happening in the early 1900s obviously are different from the early 2000s, early than the different 2010s. So those kinds of historical circumstances have an effect on publication. Things take place in an order, right, chronologically, and so we have to kind of resituate things when we read them. So when we ask questions of context, we ask things about where did it take place? Who are the authors? What's their connection to the material? If they're writing about, for example, uh, academic literacies and they're physicists, does that seem concordant? Does that seem like it makes sense? Or if I tell you that these are composition studies experts and they're writing about composition studies, are you more likely to take that seriously and think that their opinion on that material is more credible? So the, the credibility of the authors. So when you ask questions like, who is this author? Who are these authors? You know, what is their connection to the material? You're getting at credibility. When you ask the question, when was it published and in what original text or journal or book was it published, you're asking a, a question about where did this thing fit in in time. And the same idea with historical circumstances. You can imagine anything written in the early 2000s, for example, may have a historical basis in, in a post-9-11 world, right? Something written before September 20, uh, 2001 is going to read differently than after 9-11 by necessity. The world has changed. We focus on new things and new themes. So historical information goes a long way to helping us understand things. When you read something, though, like the Binkley and Smith article on um, composition studies and Aristotelian uh, rhetoric, it, it's really difficult, though, to approach that and say, well, what was happening in composition studies in 2006? Or the same thing with the New London Group reader. What was happening when this text was written that maybe affected their writing of this? 
there's not an easy answer, there's not a right or wrong answer, but you have to go look. And that's the, the idea of these notes. This is why they're laborious to a degree, is they require you to do more than read page one, page two, page three, page four. You have to stop, look up words, look up authors, find out who they are. If you see a, a proper name, someone's name, or the t name of a text, and you don't know what it is, stop and look it up, make a note in your text, because that's critical reading, and that's what you're doing here. When you think about structure and appeals, this is the, kind of the next step. You're deeper into it, right? You've considered who wrote this, what's, what's the writer's connection to the text. Now you're thinking about structure. How is it made? My go-to uh, comparison is always going to be Romeo and Juliet for ENC 1101, 1143, because it's familiar, or Julius Caesar, or any Shakespearean play. They have five acts. You could summarize uh, Romeo and Juliet in a paragraph or a page and just talk your way through the plot and re-narrate it chronologically. But what if you were to explain up front that, you know, Romeo and Juliet has five acts. In the first act, this happens. In the second act, this happens. In the third, etc. All of a sudden, the structure that you've taken it apart to see makes the text make sense so you can actually explain it. It's been itinerized, right? You have an itinerary of the steps that take place. And this is useful because when you take a text apart, and oftentimes academic texts have headings, subheadings, breaks, things that don't make it look like paragraph, 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 stacked on paragraph. Authors are kind in this way. Many authors do put breaks in there, so you can see that they're switching ideas. They're building onto a new idea, that idea of a transition, right? This is a kindness that they're perpetrating for you so you can better understand their idea. They're not trying to be opaque, generally. So when you look at that, think about why they made the transition and how you can understand that. And if you find, for example, that you're having trouble understanding a section, know that a lot of sections are built kind of as, a, not in a vacuum, they work with other sections, but you can focus on one section at a time to kind of get an idea before you move on. So that idea of structure has, has a big um, effect on how you read a text. Imagine you were to uh, watch or read Harry Potter and the chapters were out of order. You'd wonder what you're reading because it wouldn't be chronological or sequential in some way. Structure is, is a choice, is a rhetorical feature of a text. We can take any words we want and put them in any order. In any order can we put words as we structure them. And it makes sense one way more easily than others. So think about that. Authors don't just put ideas on paper and it's done. They consider what needs to go where to help you, me, the readers, understand and move through a text in a way that helps us to get to knowledge. So think about that as you're reading through that. And other features, do they use narratives? Are they telling stories? And even if the text is not a narrative, even if it's nonfiction, we usually get anecdotes, small things, as small as a sentence can be a narrative. So you're looking to see, do, do authors employ narratives or metaphors or personification, different kinds of uh, figurative language or figures of speech to help them convey an idea, for example. Purpose is one of those questions that is going to be a little bit unwieldy and hard to approach, and that's why it's not the first question. This idea of what's going on here in terms of purpose is one you're trying to approach after you've read the text at least once. Oftentimes you'll find this in an introductory component or a conclusion component of, a, of an academic essay, but the idea of the purpose is, well, generally speaking, most authors you're going to read are not just informing you. It's not a, um, even history tends to have a purpose, it's supposed to be some sort of a didactic, I guess, but it's not simply to inform, generally it's to argue, to illustrate, to um, contradict, to put information out there to see what sticks, what doesn't stick. So if you think, for example, anything you read is just going to be straightforward, here's, my, here's the truth of the world, maybe put that in brackets for a second. Ask the question, do I agree with this person? Could I see someone else disagreeing in another way here? If so, is this an argument? Or is this something else that's happening? To think about answering this one question. If you add the words, there's three of them, in order to, to the end of a sentence, to kind of figure out what is this text doing? You know, the authors inform the readers about this topic in order to do what? What's the bigger purpose here? You've read that text, what did they want you to get out of it? Do they want you to see that there was iniquity in the world? Do they want you to see that there are other ways to do things? Do they want to challenge societal norms, for example? And as you think about the purpose of the text, think about how these authors are getting to the purpose. And think about asking the question critically, right? Do they do it? Do they actually get to their purpose? Or do they have this great purpose, but their text never really reaches to it? You're a savvy reader. You're able to judge that. So take advantage of that. That's the idea of the notes. The main idea component of the text. This is one that's generally pretty straightforward, but sometimes maybe a little variety in explaining it um, among yourselves. But when you get to this part of the, the rhetorical reading notes, it's for you to think about how to write a one-sentence summary of the text. And here's my advice for that. In text title, the authors do this. 
or do these things. So, for example, in um, recomposing space, uh, Marissa or Roberta Binkley and Marissa Smith discuss ideas of Aristotelian logic and uh, Western rhetoric to show how it's not the only one in the world, so we can rethink how to approach uh, rhetoric in um, Anglo-American universities. That's a long sentence, but it kind of encapsulates a big idea here, right? So think about, for your purposes, going through the text and look back where you highlighted or where you circled, where you asterisked, and ask the question, did you find something that was an overarching idea, or do you find something and say, yep, this is the main point? And again, academic writing tends to be, I won't say transparent, but pretty upfront because they want you to see why they're writing. Look in abstracts, for example, at the start of a paper. Look in the introduction or conclusion for a restatement of it. They often explain why and the costs for which they're trying to argue, why they're trying to do this to get to that idea. That's a lot of information. But again, the rhetorical reading notes are, are a useful tool for you. They're a way to get a grip on a text that's otherwise pretty slippery or pretty uh, mobile. So when you read a text and say, I don't get it, great. You're not supposed to get every text you read. This is not a Harry Potter, this is not a simple fiction or a TV show you just kind of passively digest. You're reading critically. You're trying to take apart a text to get content out of it and understand it. You may not understand a text 100%. And that's rarely the goal when it comes to what we're reading in this class, for example. You want to understand it, you want to work towards understanding it. These rhetorical reading notes are a way for you to get a grip on something and say, you know what, I don't get all of it, but I get this. I understand the authorship. I understand the connection from the author to the text and see why they're writing what they're writing. I think I get the main idea. And as soon as you post that online, you know, you're into your class and share it with your peers, you get to see what did they see as valuable? What did they see as the main idea? And that conversation starts to complicate how you read the text. Moreover, when you complete the rhetorical reading notes, and if you do the sufficient job, you know, you have complete sentences or your answers aren't just yes, no responses, uh, that is the better the quality of the notes anyway, the better your summary tends to be because you have a good work product. You've grappled with this text and you've taken something from it and now you understand how to discuss it in a certain way. Next step, write a summary paragraph of it to reduce your idea saying this is what the text was. The authors talk about this in order to do this, it has these parts, it works in these ways, these connections are made, these kinds of examples, etc., etc. And that's it, a simple summary at the end. So as you have questions, feel free to ask them here. Come into the Writing Center, work with a peer tutor, your instructor. Ask questions though. These notes are not meant to be punitive or onerous, uh, as I've remarked elsewhere. They're meant to be useful for you. If you're not using them to be useful, then you have to ask yourself why you're even bothering to ask the questions.